The Association of the United States Army is pleased to welcome you to AUSA's Thought Leaders webinar series, a webinar series featuring military leaders and contemporary military authors. Kicking off today's webinar is AUSA's Vice President of NCO and Soldier Programs, Sergeant Major of the Army, retired Dan Daly. Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome to the Association of the United States Army's Thought Leaders webinar series. Thank you for joining us today. And while we wish we could all be together here at AUSA, that's not currently possible. So we've crafted a series of events to bring you senior Army leaders, authors, and other speakers on topics of current interest to America's Army, all in a live interactive form. We're very glad you've joined us today and appreciate your support as partners in the defense of this great nation. Joining us today to discuss their new book are the offers of Breaching the Summit. Leadership Lessons from the U.S. Military's Best. For, for, for those joining us online today, please take advantage of having the Summit 6 team here to ask questions. You can use the Q&A tab on the right side of your screen to submit a question. After the SMA Preston talks about the book, we'll take as many questions as we have time for today. Also, if you'd like to purchase a copy of the book, as you can see that several times throughout pre pre the presentation, there'll be pop-ups with an offer for you to be able to purchase Breaching the Summit. For more details of each of the leaders and authors' many accomplishments and decorations, you can access their full bio in the handout tab on the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Now I'll briefly introduce this incredible group. Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, USMC retired, Michael P. Barrett, was born and raised in Youngstown, New York. He enlisted in the Marine Corps in March of 1981 and culminated his career in the military as a 17th Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps from June 9th, 2011 to February 20th, 2015. Michael, welcome to the Thought Leader Series. Mick Pond West was born in Rising Fawn, Georgia. He graduated from Northwest Georgia High School in 1981 and immediately entered the U.S. Navy. West became the 12th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy on December 12th, 2008, and held the position until September 2012. Rick, welcome to the show. Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, James A. Roy, grew up in Monroe, Michigan, and entered the Air Force in September of 1982. In 2009, Command Master Chief Roy became the 16th Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force and held this position until 2013. Chief Roy, welcome to the Thought Leader Series. Thank you. Chief Jelinski Hall was born in Little Falls, Minnesota. She enlisted in the Air Force in 1984. She assumed the position of the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chief of the National Guard Bureau in February of 2010 and held this position until 2013. Denise, welcome to the Thought Leader Series. Good morning. Thank you. Charles W. Skip Bowen was born in South Jersey and raised in Florida and enlisted in the Coast Guard in 1978. He served as the 10th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard from 2006 to 2010. And finally, Sergeant Major of the Army, Kenneth O. Preston, is a native of Mount Savage, Maryland, where he enlisted in the United States Army on June 30th, 1975. He served as the 13th Sergeant Major of the Army from January 15th, 2004 to March 1st, 2011. Team, again, welcome. Happy New Year to all of you, and we appreciate you taking the time to uh, share with you a little bit about Breaching the Summit, Leadership Lessons from the U.S. Military's Best. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to purchase a copy of the book, you'll see throughout the episode that there'll be a pop-up for you to do so. Now, to start us off today, I'll turn the mic over to the 13th Sergeant of the Army, Kenneth Preston, to give us a brief overview of Breaching the Summit. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks very much. Um, you know, this book, the whole idea of it began when all six of us were in Columbia, Missouri, where we served as military advisors for Veterans United Home Loans. And, and what we found was that every time we were together, we would share different experiences with each other. And it was after one of these uh, sessions, we were just sitting around talking. And I think it was Rick West who jumped up and said, you know, we ought to write a book. And then Skip Bowen jumped up in after it and said, yeah, I think that's a great idea. And of course, Denise joined in and eventually we all committed that you know, we'd write a book. So, so that was how the book began. And You've always heard me say that you know there's no substitute for experience, and and when you look at the authors, you know all my counterparts there. I mean, they all went from 
you know, private to being the senior enlisted advisor for their respective service or component of the service. And, and when you total up the number of years, there's nearly 200 years of experience uh, put into this book. Now, there are many books out there on leadership, but none are as practical, clear, and proven than, than what you'll find in this book. And, and what makes the lessons in leadership easy to understand is the vignettes that, that each of the authors makes you feel a part of so that you can feel the anxiety, the temperament, the fear, uh, or even the style of leadership that's used in each situation. From dealing with subordinates, peers, and demanding superiors, you know, all of us have had our successes, our challenges. We've all made mistakes. And of course, the, the best part of the book is we talk about those mistakes and, and how we learn from the mistakes and how we move forward. Um, the readers of this book, I think, will have the benefit to start their leadership and managerial experiences at a at a much higher entry level by learning from our successes and mistakes and applying them to their own occupational career. Uh, this book is for junior service members uh, looking for sound advice on their career. Uh, this book is for junior and mid-grade officers, warrant officers, and non-commissioned officers who are climbing that ladder of responsibility and they're looking for ideas of how to, how to grow the team, how to grow and develop their subordinate leaders. Uh, this book is for senior leaders. We've had you know, dozens of general officers who have said that you know, this book is on their go-to shelf to look for new ideas and for encouragement. So this book is for those also out there that uh, have no connection to the military. It's for the, the blue collar worker out there who is you know, new going into a management assignment or perhaps even a leadership position and, and once that kind of uh, experience to be able to deal and manage and build the team that they're responsible for. It's also for the senior executive who is looking for how they can improve uh, the collaboration among their teams within their organization uh, and how they can continue to build this team of teams within their business. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to um, our editor who did all the initial editing you can imagine, you know, six different personalities from all the different services, as well as the components of the service, and to be able to, to cobble this together and make the book readable as you go from one individual to another. But, uh, but Miss Elaine Wells Harmer, you know, did, did a magnificent job. Uh, a big shout out to Casemate Publishers, uh, Mr. Daniel uh, Yeselonis, who was the marketing executive, who also did a great job at uh, putting this thing together to make it possible. And a big shout out to Mr. Joe Craig there at AUSA, uh, to General Ham, Lieutenant General Swan, SMA Daily, and of course, Alana, who's been keeping us all together to be able to do this webinar. And we just want to say thanks uh, for this opportunity. Well, Ken, thank you for that introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, Ken said it perfectly. This is a collection of leadership lessons from a group of individuals uh, that uh, join the service as young enlisted and rise to the top. Um, this is over 200 years collectively of military experience. So I encourage you, there's something in this book for everyone. And uh, I'm already noticing a lot of questions coming in from our audience because I know there are a lot of questions for, for each one of you. And again, we appreciate you taking the time to spend a little bit of your day with us to share the leadership lessons and the experiences of breaching the summit. So I'll start off with a couple of questions you received previously, um, and I'll start off with Jim, Jim Roy. Throughout the book, you speak about the joint team. Where does your passion for the joint warfighter come from? Again, I just uh, thank you for letting us start off this, but uh, thank you for allowing us an opportunity to do this. As uh, SMA had mentioned, we're certainly appreciative of that. My uh, my passion for joining this comes from uh, started off as a as a young airman basic uh, when I went to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri for my not AIT but for my. Um, career development for the United States Air Force. And I got a chance to work with soldiers. I got a chance to be uh, taught by soldiers um, and my appreciation for, for what they do, what you do as soldiers each and every day uh, kind of came out in that. And then later uh, I went to uh, different uh, assignments as most of us have and different TDYs that most of us have. 
I've got a chance to work with the uh, United States Marine Corps in Okinawa. Got a chance to work with uh, the Coast Guard out in uh, out in Hawaii, uh, and certainly throughout that, um, had a chance to work with the United States Navy, where I ended up as the United States Pacific Command Senior Enlisted Leader, working for Admiral Tim Keating. So had a chance to work with all the services. And certainly, I, I don't want to forget our, our Air National Guard, Army, Army Guard, um, with, with Denise Jelinski Hall, an opportunity that we've had over the numerous, numerous years, we've had an opportunity to work together. So my appreciation for the joint service services comes from my experience, my, my experience watching other, other services and how they do things and taking from that bits and pieces of it to make my service, the United States Air Force, even better than what it uh, what it was. So uh, that's where my passion comes from uh, for joining us. Well, Jim, thank you for that An important message for all of our service members out there that, you know, we always constantly have to find ways we can work better with our sister services and being joined is something that we can all do a little bit better on. And your message on how important it is, is important to the force. Um, Mick Bon West, over to you. Um, you discussed engaged leadership many times throughout the book. Can you speak to the importance of that? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, first of all, uh, Sergeant Major, thanks for having us. And to AUSA, thank you very much. You know, uh, I think Ken summed it up really uh, uh, thoughtfully at, up front when he talked about the book and the different vignettes and stories that are in there about the engaged leadership. And I would say when you talk about engaged leadership in this book, there's so many examples and it's not just us. It's about the engaged leadership we also received. We also know that engaged leadership, it absolutely comes at all levels, you know, whether it's that E4 in the field or on the deck plate, you know, uh, with that evolution, or if it's that senior leader uh, out there getting things done, uh, a leader has to be engaged 24, 365. It's what we do, not only with your warriors that you're put in charge of or with, but your peers, you have to be an engaged leader uh, alongside with your peers and uh, those above you. If you see a shipmate or a warrior out there steering in the wrong direction, then it's your job to absolutely put them back on course and speed. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, that's uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to be able to be here today. Well, thank you, Rick, and we appreciate that. Um, Sergeant Major Barrett, over to you. Mike, you know, when I read the, the section of your book, you started off with your first and last day of service. And throughout your career, you had tremendous success, but we all know that doesn't come overnight. Can you share with the audience um, your keys to success and how a young leader can become successful? Uh, th hey, thanks, uh, Dan. Um, well, I would tell you, I would remind everybody, I would remind them that the nature of people is always the same and it is their habits that separate them. Um, everybody deserves to be in a good organization, led morally, ethically, and professionally. And having said that, um, I look at it as um, if you put all of your focus and effort on the three pillars of leadership, you will enhance organizational proficiency, whatever unit you're in, and organizational readiness in any endeavor. And the when I talk about the three pillars of leadership, it's something that I've been that I stayed behind. I followed and I taught from day one. And that is um, one, always set the example and never compromise the absolutes. And if you want to mo know more about the absolutes, you're going to have to buy the book and you'll see in the entire portion from page one all the way to the very end, how each and every one of us talks about what the absolutes are. So one, it's setting the example. And two, care for those in your charge. It's very important though, that you don't confuse taking care of those in your charge with coddling or solving their problems. You don't ever wanna solve a person's problems because they'll never grow if you do. And three, always be taking and making assessments. Develop yourself and your team in mind, body, and spirit. Whether it's a team of four or it's an organization of a thousand and four, be a servant leader. Only be at your desk when you absolutely need to be there. Um, your team, whether it's small or large, needs to see you out there in the trenches 
getting your hands dirty, sharing in the gritty day-to-day -day grind. Don't ever forget who's looking back at you. And to achieve your vision, where you want to be, you must give your time, your efforts, and all of your focus to those who will help you get there. Uh, there's an axiom that I've always followed in my life, and it's after every ride, focus and care in this order goes to your horse first, then your saddle, and last you, the rider. In other words, always take care of those that got you to where you are. Always ensure that your equipment and infrastructure are the very best that you can provide, and your needs and wants must always be subordinate to the team. And, um, but most importantly, never compromise the absolutes. Thank you for that, Mike. And Mike, you brought in that important point that there are consistent themes that each of you share throughout this book, but you do it each in your own unique way and style. And people are going to have to buy the book to, to read what that is. And that's an important point. Denise, over to you real quick. I gravitated immediately. I was thumbing through first and figuring out what I wanted to read first. Serving in a man's world. And I read it, every word of it. And uh, do you think women service members believe they're serving in a male dominant military and, and what advice would you have for them? Thank you, Sergeant Major. And thank you ASA for hosting us. Mm -hmm. I do believe that there is an element of that, that some of our women warriors do feel that they're serving in a man's world. And I know, you know, joining the military in 1984, you know, I too, when I look at the leadership, what was it? It was all male for the most part. Now we see that there are so many more opportunities for women today and they are achieving great things in our military. And I want to encourage them to keep doing so because we have so much to offer you know, to, to the team. So don't let that stop you. The fact that we are a woman, our uniforms are gender neutral. It doesn't matter who is in that uniform, whether male or female, we all have the same opportunities. Sometimes you just have to seek them out. You have to look for them around every corner because they don't present themselves you know, you have to go out and really look for those. Take some strategic risks, ladies. Don't disqualify yourself. I saw that time and time again, when you were looking at a male and a female package, oftentimes the, the woman would disqualify themselves before they would even, you know, submit it. Because we, we think that we have to check every single box. And typically my experience was that a, a man would look at that and say, well, I can learn that on the job. I can learn that. I can learn that. Ladies, we can do the same thing. So women warriors, you know, be strong, be courageous, be bold, and don't let the fact that we're women take anything away from you. We're, we're equally as good as any other man out there. Well, Denise, thank you for that great advice. And for our female service members out there listening, if you want a membership experience in a book, Denise's section of this book is full of that for our young female um, future leaders. And thank you for the what you share inside that book. And again, I encourage you, ladies and gentlemen, to take a look at the leadership lessons that each one of these phenomenal leaders I have to offer. Uh, finally, Skip, you start a chapter, and uh, I think Mike talked about it, with the words, lead by example. Why is that so important? Thanks, Dan, and thanks to AUSA. I'm a longtime AUSA member. I really believe in your organization, and it is, uh, of all the military service organizations, right at the top. Uh, the, how I actually joined AUSA uh, I, I am a uh, class 52 graduate of the Sergeant's Major Academy, and uh, which is also a great organization. And in preparation, I'm a Coast Guard guy, of course. And in preparation for that, uh, I was in a, a PX somewhere and I picked up a book because I do read. And folks that are watching this uh, leadership lessons learned from books can stick with you. And this book was called The Three Meter Zone, Common Sense Leadership for NCOs. It was written by a, an Army Command Sergeant Major named J.D. Pendry. And the crux of the book was, at the end of the day, all a soldier learns about leading or following is learned from another soldier, an NCO, those close to him within his three-meter zone. That's a direct quote from the book. And I found that to be through, true throughout my career. Uh, you know, I think of uh, an early unit that I was at, uh, we had very poor leadership. The, uh, there was an E7 actually in charge of that, that uh, command. Uh, uh, constant. I, I would have gotten out of the Coast Guard had it been based only on that unit. But uh, later on, uh, 
well, quite frankly, I got married and I had children and, uh, and I thought, well, I better hang around because at least it's a paycheck. And I went to another unit where the leadership empowered us, the leadership motivated us, the leadership uh, pushed us to be better uh, than we were. Uh, it, it, it is uh, leading by example is almost everything there is. I mean, there's a lot more to to it. There's communication. There's a, there's a lot of things to leadership, but you have to be the example. So that's uh, that was my point there, uh, Dan. Well, thanks for that, Skip. And just to comment on the point you made up front is we've all known it's a it's a known fact that the, the Coast Guard has always sent their very best to the United States Army Sergeant Major Academy. And I know they will continue to do that forever. So let's go out to our audience. We're getting a lot of questions. And ladies and gentlemen, just to remind you, if you have a question for this phenomenal group today, click on the Q&A tab. If you see a question that's already there that you want to publish, you can also upvote that question, too, to take it to the top. We're going to start off with a question from Roger C. What is the single leadership lesson each of you want to take from your military experiences that you can share with our audience today? And I'll start with Ken Preston. Okay, thanks, uh, SMA. You know, as I as I look at uh, the things that I took, you know, Skip Bowen just said really everything, and it's it's really about leading by example. And and when you when you think about that, what does leading by example really mean? And in, and in today's world, with, with all that we have going on, you know, leading by example is not only, you know, how you carry yourself, how you address your subordinates, your peers, or your superiors, but it's also, you know, how you carry yourself off duty. It's how you carry yourself when you're 500 miles away from a military installation. It's, it's how you present yourself on social media. It's how you present yourself in front of your troops with your family. So, so leading by example is, is all inclusive. And, and I think our young people today, as they join the military service, you know, what they're really looking for is somebody to emulate, somebody to kind of pattern their life after and follow that particular example. Thanks for that, Ken. And Jim, up to you. What would be the one leadership lesson that you would impart uh, to our audience today? Thank you, SMA. Um, one of the things that you'll read in the book is uh, the diversity uh, backgrounds that we have. Um, I mean, all of us come from different different locations, but uh, the one thing that uh, I would I would key in on is that is trust. Um, some of us may have come from a, a you know background that we didn't necessarily trust people, um, but what I have found throughout my career, even on into my civilian career is you've got to trust people. And that trust, obviously you've got to, you've got to help them build because um, they may have the same background. So you provide them an opportunity to take on uh, different leadership roles within your unit, within your organization, um, but you got to trust them. You, you've got to give them an opportunity to succeed or fail. And you know when they do succeed, you, you acknowledge that. And when they fail, you help them. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the, the probably the, uh, the biggest opportunity I had um, while, while serving, uh, when I served with Admiral Tim Keating out in Pacific Command, and at that particular time, we were going back and forth with China, uh, a little bit different times than it is today. We were going back and forth with China, and one of the things that uh, Admiral Keating asked me to do was uh, to have a a group of senior enlisted or a group of enlisted, not necessarily senior, but a group of enlisted go to China as a delegation. Um, we led that. I led that organization to go there. And they were reciprocated that when they came back. Um, unfortunately, uh, there were three enlisted uh, from the 12. Uh, for us, it was all enlisted. I led it. Um, but Admiral Keating was the person that uh, when the when the chief of staff spoke up and said, Hey, I want to. Uh, I we've got a we've got a two star coming uh, from China from the PLA, and and I I think uh, myself as a two star, I think I ought to be the one that uh, that leads that that uh, visit. And uh, Admiral Keating was looking down, taking notes, and he looked up at all of us, a very small group of uh, five. He looked up and he looked over to the chief of staff, said, "Chief Roy does all of our enlisted delegation in this theater of operation," um, and. From that day forward, um, you know, I knew the weight was on my shoulders, but Admiral Keating trusted me. 
he trusted me. And I thought to myself, from even from that day forward, my goodness, what it is to trust people and give them the tools to do their job, trust that they're going to do that, and then acknowledge that uh, success or, like I said, um, help help them uh, correct uh, some of the mistakes that they have made. So trust would be the one that I would focus in on. Uh, that's an incredible lesson and one that is critically important, Jim. You, you're right. And it not only sends a message to the service members of our own country, but of to the foreign nation, like you said, that you were a delegation of. And it shows them how important is the trust relationship between the enlisted and the officers, um, like, it, it, like it exists in our military today. Rick, if you could please share, what, what is the most important leadership lesson that you would impart in our audience? Uh, you know, I think attention to detail. Now, I would say that Ken and Jim both absolutely summed it up as they kind of pushed out all their lessons. But uh, to me, attention to detail, I learned that uh, very young as a sailor uh, coming up through the ranks. And I, I'm a firm believer that, uh, you know, as a leader, when you walk down the pier, or when you walk across a quarter deck or into the field, wherever you may be, you can learn a lot and see a lot by the initial uh, look as you, as you walk down that pier, for example, you know, attention to detail. How is that uh, watch on the quarter deck? How, it, how professionally is that soldier, sailor, airman, and Marine responding back to you? And you can tell a lot by that. Once you walk into those spaces too, if you see a lot of good, healthy banter going back and forth, that's usually a sign of a pretty good command. They, they, they get it. They understand, you know, it's funny. I was out on an aircraft carrier once and it was probably 120 degrees on the flight deck. They were deployed to the Middle East. I looked in the galley, the scullery. You know, that's where they wash the dishes. And this, this young man is in there, and its steam is just boiling out of this space. And he's washing those dishes. He's singing. I stick my head in the window and say, hey, shipmate, how are you? And, you know, I, after I said that, I go, oh, man, I opened my, uh, myself up for, you know, quite the comeback. But what he come back to me with is he says, hey, uh, I'm launching aircraft, Nick Pond, and I go, huh. And what hit me then was the fact that he thought and he knew, he knew that his job was so important, even though that he was washing dishes, that he contributed to the mission. So I think attention to detail everywhere you go uh, is a very, very important thing. And I think that's just uh, when you look at each of the chapters, each of the leaders that are on this uh, venue today, uh, you'll see that. Um, there's a big focus on attention to detail. So thanks. Well, thank you, Rick. And ladies and gentlemen, if you just joined us, this is the Thought Leader Series with the Summit Six, talking about their new book, Breaching the Summit, Leadership Lessons from the U.S. Military's Best. And now on to Michael Barrett. Mike, what is the most important leadership lesson that you'd like to share with our audience? Uh, always be training and always be fit. Even at the ripe old age of 58 right now, um, I'm up and out of the rack every single morning, 4.30, and I hit the road. I work out for a couple hours. I come back. I read for a couple hours. I stop. I think about what I just read. I write down my thoughts about what I think I just thought about. I'm always uh, training, and I like to refer to it as optimal combat fitness or optimal fitness readiness, readiness whatever term you want to use. And it's broken in my optimal readiness is broken down into five categories and each one of them has a subcategory and I'll, and I'll just hit them real quick, but being physically fit, I don't need to go into detail why that's important. Uh, two, being cognitively fit and cognitive fitness is broken down into a few areas. And I want to touch on each one of those is cognitive fitness has, are you mentally agile? Are you able to handle multiple tasks in chaotic environment, making critical decisions at critical times? Uh, being mentally tough. Mentally tough induces physical toughness, willpower, determination, mental poise, good health, and self-confidence. And then martial spirit is also a part of the cognitive fitness. And martial spirit is that fighting spirit that each and every one of us has inside of us. Uh, even if I'm outnumbered three to one, there's no doubt in my mind I'm going to win. Uh, it's just having a good, optimistic fighting spirit. And to round out the cognitive fitness of being agile and tough and having that right martial spirit, you need to also possess that equanimity, that ability to remain calm under stress or pressure so that you don't get auditory or visual exclusion and you're still able to take in 
the everything ambient coming into you. And then the third portion of optimal readiness is being morally fit. And I always like to go back and touch on that one creed that you learn day one at recruit training and you recite it every single night before you hit the rack. And that's the rifleman's creed. Um, and it, there's a portion inside of it that says, I must master my rifle as I master my life. I will keep my rifle clean and ready, even as I am clean and ready. Moral fitness is the imperative if you want to be an effective leader. And the fourth element of being optimally ready is possessing the knowledge and skills required to perform your job, not just your job, but all the jobs of those who are subordinate to you that you're responsible to and for, and that you are, you've been studying and working on the knowledge and skills that you may need if you have to take over for that person that's above you. And the fifth portion of being optimally ready is family fitness. So is your family socially fit? Do they have friends and relatives close uh, close by prepared to jump into action if the need arises? Is your family spiritually fit? And I don't, and you don't need to be religious to be spiritually fit. Is your family, are their hearts happy? Are their minds in a good place? Are they resilient? Are they engaged in activities that allow them to grow and develop? Spiritual well-being or spiritual wholeness means all parts of you and your family are working together. And then financially is all falls underneath family fitness. Um, if you are having financial issues, I'm here to tell you when you're at work, your head is not in the game and you just became a liability. So I like to refer to this one thing that I've carried with me my entire life is being always be training, always be fit, optimal fitness readiness, because total fitness means that you're balanced and whole in mind, body, and spirit. Mike, I, what a great, what a great lesson. Um, it's something I wholeheartedly believe and affirm and something I honestly and publicly will admit that the Marine Corps does very well. And so thanks for your leadership during that time, because uh, yeah. Marines, when you look at them, they are fit and in many measures, as you described. Denise, could you share with us, please? Uh, what's your leadership lesson you'd like to share with our audience? Thank you, Sergeant Major Daly. It is really tough to follow these gentlemen, isn't it? My goodness, those are great, great points. So I have, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, now I have to think of something different from them. So <laughs> the point that I chose is to take strategic risks and respectfully don't take no for an answer. So whether you're a mid-level warrior or a senior you know, NCO, do not let yourself be stovepiped. The, the path to the top is not straight up. Sometimes you have to go a little bit left or a little bit right. Sometimes you have to take a step back. In the National Guard, a lot of times, it's all about what position or what slot you're in, what slot you're in. And there was a time where I, I took a very strategic risk. I was uh, an E-8 uh, in an E-9 position. So had I stayed there long enough and continued to be a good airman, most likely I would have been promoted. Well, I elected to, you know, think a little bit broader, and I took a strategic risk, and I went into a different command, into an E8 slot with absolutely no hope of being promoted. It, it just wasn't there. There was no E9 position available. But it wasn't, it wasn't about promotion. So if you're not concerned so much about promotion as opposed to doing what is right for the organization in which you serve and for the men and women that you lead and for the country, then good things will happen. So take those strategic risks. Take a look at where can I get some broad experience over here or over there in a different command, uh, a different unit, whatever that is, take strategic risks. Just so happens that, you know, the part of respectfully do not take no for an answer. Uh, I wanted to apply for a particular position and had I listened to a couple of senior leaders, uh, it would never have happened. So I respectfully didn't take no for an answer. I got in the books, I got in the regs, I figured it out. You know, trust but verify, that's very, very important. Trust but verify. So I trusted, but then I verified. And when I verified, I found out something different, that yes, in fact, I could do this. And so on went the career. But don't be afraid to take those strategic risks. You know, you get a lot of broad, broad training and a bigger picture 
when I was in Hawaii for almost 20 years, I thought, you know, I kind of got this going on. I knew the Pacific, but man, once I went to the National Guard Bureau, the picture, the site picture totally changed. It wasn't just about the Pacific anymore. So continue to grow and develop yourself and uh, take those strategic risks. Very important. Well, thanks, Denise. And you're right. These gentlemen are a tough act to follow. But as always, and as you do in this book, you hold your ground well with imparting your leadership lessons to the audience. So thank you for that, Denise. And, and lastly, uh, Skip, um, the leadership lesson you'd like to share with our audience. Well, you know, uh, something that I've always found of interest is leadership and risk management or leadership in a high risk environment. You know, the Coast Guard had this motto uh, when I first joined. It really still has it, but it's it's not the same. But it's uh, you have to go out, but you don't have to come back. And uh, I mean, the, uh, these folks took this uh, very seriously. I mean, even when I was first in in the uh, late 70s, uh, they, nobody thought anything about it. Send that little boat over 100 miles offshore. You know, it was like there was there were no limits there. Were, but somewhere along the line, a lot of risk management philosophy and thinking came in. And it almost became this thing where, you know, we like we had a. Um, a risk management tool, an assessment tool. You had like a, a number of factors that you would talk about before you uh, started on a mission. And then you'd have, you'd, you'd uh, green, amber, or red, you decided. And red, of course, if it, if you were going to do something in the red, you know, I mean, lives had to be at stake or some some huge issue to, to undertake that kind of mission. Well, a lot of leaders I noticed really kind of irritated me, took that to mean, oh, I, I don't have to do anything during that time period. And I started really preaching as, especially I, as I became senior. No, that's not what it's about. Risk management tools are there to, uh, risk management is there to inform action. It doesn't dictate action. So it informs, you know, you, you can do, you, you, could, you should, and you can and should use those tools to, uh, to properly assess how you're gonna undertake this mission. That doesn't mean you don't undertake the mission. And, uh, but you can mitigate risk through these tools. And uh, really I have a whole chapter on this because I, I found it fascinating. I have a couple of really good examples about how it was like a free for all without enough, without, a, without enough, enough thought on this particular mission that we did. We, were, we had this warning shots disabling fire mission down in the Florida Keys. Uh, boats fleeing from Cuba would bring, uh, they were smuggling, coming into the uh, Florida Keys. We were, we would, uh, we would shoot out their engines. And, you know, there was a, a number of uh, steps that you had to take to, uh, to get permission to shoot out these engines. And you also had to be uh, very aware it was a high risk deal. Uh, you know, you, be, besides the obvious risk of uh, shooting, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you're quite close to shore just shooting up these, uh, uh, people shoot back at you. It's a, uh, it's an interesting mission. But at any rate, uh, one of them went horribly wrong, and that I talk about in the book. And in, in another uh, case that I use, everything went a lot better. And it was because we did stop and think and use some of these risk mitigation principles. But that didn't stop us from completing the mission. It just meant we thought about it and mitigated some of that risk. So that's my favorite, anyway. Well, Skip, thank you, and. That's the sobering reality of the tough decisions that leaders have to make every day, because um, what we do has incredible risk uh, each and every day, but great leaders calculate it and uh, react and anticipate the risk um, so they can bring soldiers, sailing, coasties, and airmen home. So thanks for sharing that. So let's go back out to our audience. We got a bunch of questions stacking up. And ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, if you have a question today, click the Q&A tab. Uh, we have an incredible wealth of knowledge here uh, with the Summit 6. So the first question is for Andrew. Good morning. Are there any tools out there in helping senior non-commissioned officers better their careers after they depart? And I'll throw that one up to whoever would like to answer it first. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Uh, you know, in uh, lesson six of my section, and I'm pretty sure every single, as a matter of fact, I know every single one of us talked about this. Um, you know, I went to uh, our transition readiness seminar and everything I needed to help myself be successful after I left the military was presented and provided to me in 
my services uh, transition right in his seminar. And afterwards, after I left, uh, officially walked out of, the, out of the Marine Corps, I went to my county veteran service officer. Every single county across the United States has them. It's the best hour and 45 minutes you'll spend in your lifetime is sitting down with your CVSO because they will point you in every direction uh, that you can imagine to help set yourself up, uh, not just in your, your uh, close-knit community, but um, across the state and anything else that you want to do. So I would tell you to um, utilize and take to heart everything that's taught you at your transition readiness seminars. And I believe... Um, uh, it, I, I believe the Army and the Air Force have a different name name for it, but I, I know the Marine Corps and the Navy uh, use TRS. Thanks, Mike. Our next question is from Ed. He says, the higher someone progresses in the enlisted rank chain, the further they get from the junior enlisted. And how difficult was it for each of you to not be there on a daily basis with your junior enlisted? And I'd like to go up to Rick. Rick, could you answer that one for us, please? Yeah. Hey, thank you. You know, I, I don't I don't know that I completely agree with that. I know maybe in structure you do, but that's uh, as you move up in the rank two, I think if you have that communication with your leaders at every level across your your service, then you're going to be absolutely in touch with those soldier sailors and airmen or Marines that are around. I get the fact that, yeah, hey, I was the MCPON, but I also think when you look in this book that we have, we also spend a lot of time on the road. Our job was not sitting at a desk. Our job was out there seeing what our warriors were doing. And granted, we're not out there for every evolution, but I can guarantee you that this group uh, knew the status of their force. They knew their people and they knew what their leaders were out there. They're doing on a daily basis. So, yeah, I mean, I understand the question, but I, I also think that, uh, you know, like I said, you can't lead from behind a computer screen either. I don't know. I think I traveled about 80, 85 percent of my time. And I can tell you that many of the folks on this screen did the same thing because we were never in D.C. together at the same time. And then you throw on a couple of conflicts across the world uh, and then that puts us even in a, a more traveling state. So that, that's kind of my answer for that. But I think well, thanks for that, Rick. And I would agree. I mean, uh, during my tenure, I watched each of you uh, and I aspired uh, when I sailed to the same ranks of being able to be as accessible as all of you did, because it is incredibly difficult in the position. There's many dues and responsibilities that keep you at the at the Pentagon, but um, you have to work very hard to stay engaged with the service members out there. So thank you for all the time that you put into that. Next question is from Tracy. And I'd like Denise to answer this one, if we could, please. Uh, once you became a senior leader, did you find a consistent message amongst the group that you gave to junior officers that set them on a great path to leadership because she says, I owe my 26 year career to my senior enlisted guidance as a young lieutenant. A consistent mess message between all of us. Well, I, I'm that I'm not sure because, you know, there's different messages between the, the six of us, depending upon the mission and the branch of service. But personally, was there a consistent message for me? You know, it was always and I, I'll even go back a little bit to that last question. Thoughtful leadership. You know, I think I can speak for all six of us that when we would be out on the road, we would seek out the junior enlisted to really, you know, touch base with them and see what's on their minds, how could, how we could better help them. So my message then would be consistently was to be ready, always be ready for that next leadership opportunity, whether you're military or civilian, uh, being ready is more than just knowing your job. It's being an expert in your respective field and then expanding beyond those specific job skills. And Sergeant Major Barrett talked about that. Being ready about, is about knowing yourself and pushing yourself beyond those perceived capabilities. Taking inventory of your strengths and weaknesses. And we typically work in our strength zone, but we need to be very mindful of the things that we're not strong in and work on those things. So. I would be very consistent in telling people that if you recognize the things, the areas where you're not strong, work on those. If you are not strong in public speaking, 
take your speech class, start volunteering to brief, get in front of people, record yourself, practice, prepare. If writing was a shortfall, and as senior leaders, I think all of us can attest to that you're doing a considerable amount of writing. If that is a, a shortfall, practice, take a writing class and write articles and newsletters and things like that. And Sergeant Major Barrett already talked about physical fitness. If that's a shortfall, then you know, get to the gym, get a buddy, et cetera. But while you're doing your present job, Always be hungry to learn more. Seek out how to better improve yourself by self-development. Read, read, read. Listen to podcasts on leadership. Uh, listen, go to seminars and talk with senior leaders. Being ready is always about being prepared for that next opportunity. And as I said earlier, they don't always present themselves. Sometimes you have to seek them out. But the bottom line is the consistent message is be ready for the moment when the leadership taps you on the shoulder and calls your name up to the team because it's going to come when you least expect it. So grow and develop yourself to, to be ready for that next incredible opportunity. Thank you for that, Denise. And our next question, and we're running short on time today, ladies and gentlemen, so I apologize if we don't get to all your questions, but we will make sure each of your questions get to each one of the Summit 6. But our next one is specifically for SMA Preston. Ken, what advice would you give to a new battalion squadron commander at your first sit down? Sure. You know, one of the things that, uh, that I really miss now being retired is uh, not having the opportunity as the SMA to go to Leavenworth each month and talk to the pre-command course. Um, you know, for, for all the new battalion brigade commanders out there that are going into command, first thing I would say is, is have fun. Because if you're having fun, you're enjoying the command, then everybody within that command is going to enjoy the enjoy your presence as well. Um, but one of the things I used to enjoy doing was, um, you know, the relationship between a battalion commander and their command star major. That, that NCO officer relationship is, is one that's very unique and, uh, and it's a very close relationship in that, you know, your command star major represents you. You know, that star major is the star major of the command. And and the thing that always um, helped me as I looked at my role models out there as I was coming up through the ranks was to be a force provider so that when I went out and I visited those subordinate units within the command, you know, one, I gained the trust of the, of the officer leadership within those units and organizations, but I gained the trust and confidence of the senior NCOs because I was there to uh, identify those challenges that the unit had to help them be a success at the missions and the orders that, that my commander had given them to execute. And, and to be able to go out there and sit down with a young company or troop commander and understand the challenges that they had at executing the missions that, that you as a battalion commander had given them, and then to be able to not necessarily come back and be a spy for the battalion commander or the squadron commander, but but to help that young company commander overcome those challenges and be a success. And, and that's how I see a lot of the senior non-commissioned officers out there in the units is to be able to go out and help those subordinate leaders be a success at the missions that my commander gave them. And I think that that's one of the things as I look at my role models, that's what made them a success. And, and I enjoyed a lot of success of that at each level of command as I moved up in uh, positions of responsibility. Well, thanks for that, Ken. We appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll have to close now because we are out of time today. And again, we couldn't get through all of your questions, and but we do appreciate you asking them. And we will make sure those questions get to the Summit 6. I'd like to close by just making a comment, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to hear more about these leadership lessons, you can purchase Breaching the Summit at AUSA.org or click buy now on the screen. I also like to close out by saying there's an incredible forward in this book written by General Retired Pace. But there's also an incredible afterward um, that is important and important to know because none of us go through these military journeys by ourselves. We do it with an incredible family behind us. And Skip, I would ask you as you close out, could you talk about the importance? Because each one of your spouses contributed to the afterward in this book. And it was so passionate and powerful to me that I had to bring it up today. But as you close out for us today, could you talk about the importance of a strong family relationship in your journey? from a young enlisted soldier to the top of your service. It's absolutely incredibly important. And, uh, you know, as we debated on the afterward for this book, we, uh, uh, somebody threw that out. Maybe it was Denise, but uh, she comes up with a lot of great ideas. But uh, definitely that was a, a winner. And uh, our spouses were with us every step of the way. 
through all of our military journeys. And um, they put that together. And I think it is a it, it is a great statement uh, about military spouses and how they are important to the family, uh, to the uh, children growing up, uh, because a lot of times, uh, as uh, Rick West was saying, uh, you're, you're away 80, 85 percent of the time. I mean, it's incredibly hard and a, uh, a strong spouse is important. Uh, so uh, so as I close, I just say for all walks of life, whether you're in the military, or out of the military, this book is unique. There's never been a book written by I mean, we all served at the same time uh, through the incredibly uh, important years between the uh, uh, you know, the late seventies and into the, uh, you know, into the, this, this decade. And I'll tell you, um, uh, it is a unique book. It will, uh, it will help you every leadership walk of life can learn something from this book. So please check it out. Uh, breaching the summit. Thank you very much. Thanks to AUSA and to Dan. Well, thank you so much, Six. And thank you for your imparting your incredible wisdom with us today and sharing a little bit of your time and Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to learn more about this incredible, vast knowledge base, Reaching the Summit, hosted by the Association of the United States Army here on Thought Leaders today, and you can go to AUSA.org and purchase that book. And ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say thank you, Summit 6, for your time today and imparting this incredible knowledge with us. You are truly our nation's credentials. Before we part, I wanted to inform you of a few upcoming events here at the Association of the United States Army. Our next AUSA Noon Report will be held on 12 January with the Sergeant Major of the Army, SMA Michael A. Grinston. On 19 January, we will host another AUSA Noon Report with the Chief of Staff of the United States Army, General James C. McConville. And on 22 January, another Thought Leader Series with Kevin Marr, author of Rock Force. There are some great speakers, and I hope you can join us for each one of those upcoming episodes. And for more information about any of these events or to register, please visit our website at AUSA.org. And finally, we thank all those who support us, especially our members, because ladies and gentlemen, membership matters. And through your membership, you support soldiers, families, and everyone who supports the United States Army and the Association. We appreciate your support. And if you want to renew your membership or become a member of AUSA, please visit AUSA.org. Thank you again for attending and have a great day.